Hello, you wonderful people, and welcome to another episode of Not Too Comic Book. This being a show where I talk about TV shows that are adaptations of comic books. For today's episode, I'm going to talk about the latest episode of The Flash, Legends of Tomorrow, as well as Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Like always, if I'm talking about something you want to listen to, you can always look in the description down below. I include the time of when I start talking about each of the respective shows. That way, you can skip to whatever you want to listen to. For example, if you don't want to hear what I have to say about this week's episode of The Flash, you can skip to what I had to say about this week's episode of Legend of Tomorrow or Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. But the first thing I'm going to talk about is The Flash. I literally had to record that intro like multiple times. So, finally got it right. I, I still stumbled a little bit. Nevertheless, I got through it. Anyway... This week's episode of Flash is a kind of a two-parter. It's very interesting that they put it that way when we're two-parter. I was like, okay, so are both episodes going to air like that? It's like, no, because I guess in a sense it's like an episode where it's a continuation, which obviously the story is always a continuation, but I guess like, oh, this is where the story is, and here's the other part. I don't know. It's just kind of interesting putting it like, oh, it's a two-parter. In this episode, obviously, we found out last episode that uh, Harrison Wells from Earth 2 was taken by Gorilla Grodd and taken to the... Um, Gorilla City, which I did not realize that was on Earth 2. I just assumed that was just on some Earth on its own, like, oh, that's all the world was, but it's like, no, that's Earth 2 Africa. I just, I never pieced that together. Maybe certain things, maybe they brought something up when, you know, they were like, oh, we're going to send him out somewhere else. I mean, at that time, the only other Earth, I guess it makes sense because at that time, the only other Earth they were aware of was Earth 2, but still, that kind of messes my head a little bit, because I legitimately thought it was just kind of a world on its own, just kind of all gorillas, but it's just like one particular city in Africa on Earth 2 is the Gorilla City. Uh, the people that go are Barry, um, Cisco, Caitlin, as well as uh, Julian warming his way onto it, because he's like, whoa, 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 you're going to an Earth 2? Really? Another Earth multiple di multi-dimension traveling? Oh, goodness. It's like, oh, wait, you're going to the Planet of Apes? Tell me, are you going to... Planet of the Apes, and it's just like, I love the fact that he was getting all giddy, which obviously we learned in the episode, that wasn't his main, I mean, it, part of the reason why he wanted to go, I mean, it's like, there's an opportunity to do some multi-dimensional traveling, it's like, obviously he's going to, like, want to take part in it, but also he wanted to go for Caitlyn's sake, too, because it's like, you know, he was wondering, it's like, oh, you sending Caitlyn along is a very bad thing, obviously Caitlyn's there because she's a, she has a relationship with Grodd, he always took an interest in her, so maybe she'll be able to kind of convince him to kind of back down, because his whole point is like, hey, we go there, save wells basically we could possibly change the future because there's like oh we stop everything that's happening there we can make it so that grod never you know and the gorillas never come and attack uh central city because i was wondering about it too i was like how how did they i was like it seems like this is another earth situation so how did they get i was like oh so they must find a way to get to earth one and it turns out that to be the case it turns out that this was all basically a trap laid out by Grodd. At first, he because I was actually surprised to find out Grodd's not actually the leader. That was kind of interesting because I would expect it. I mean, it's not like he's the only highly intelligent ape. It seems like all of them are. I mean, granted, even then, we still don't 100% know the smarts of the rest of the apes. At a very, I mean, gorillas. I'm, I call them apes, gorillas. Um, because the fact is that the only ones we really had any interaction with was Grodd, as well as Salivar, who was the leader, voiced by Keith David, which which is like, it makes sense. It's obvious you get Keith David. Uh, why? Because it's not like it'd be his first time voicing an animal, you know, Princess Mononoke. I can't remember his name, but it's the, the boar god or whatever that he voiced in Princess Mononoke. But nevertheless, it's because of Keith David's got that awesome voice, these guys. Like, he, oh, dude, he has such a cool voice. But, um... Basically, Grodd's like, I brought you here because I want you to stop Sal um, Salivar and not just stop him. He wants Barry to kill him because he's like, I'm not strong enough to do it. And it's like, if you don't do it, obviously Salivar is going to invade uh, Earth-1, your world, because he doesn't like humans because humans have experimented on them. I'm sure, like, basically the same way Grodd was kind of brought into creation, the same thing happened to Salivar, too. So he obviously has resentment towards humans, so he's going to kill them and everything, which Barry challenges him to a duel, which was a sick duel. I wish we got a little bit more of it, but sadly, we didn't get a lot of it. It was crazy when he, like, backhanded Barry with that shield, and we saw... I love... I literally brought it up in the other two, once again, recording things out of order, uh, slow-mo, but it's just that, that blood's are dropping it, freezing it with him kind of flying back. Um, can't do his like super fast and then punch. Then tries running around to kind of build up speed to throw lightning. That doesn't work when he kind of jumps up and does like a slam down and kind of creates like a shockwave and kind of knocks Barry off balance. So it's like you can't do that. Um, but then it was like, oh, 
you got to do a reversal on him. And so Barry does what, you know, normally would be what Reverse Flash does, you know, but when he vibrates his hands and passes it through someone kind of piercing through their body. But instead of doing the piercing aspect, you just move your hand really fast, I guess, and build up enough momentum like like you would pierce them. But instead of like phasing through them, you just hit them with the sped up um, momentum, I'm guessing. It's, I, like I said, not very science person, so but that's kind of how I'm breaking it down. It's like you build up the momentum in your hand, and whereas normally you just use it to phase through them and kill them, you just use that force as impact to kind of... I guess it's kind of the equivalent of almost a super, I forgot what the, you know, a super punch where he runs real fast, builds up enough speed, and then does a powerful punch, which is normally how he'd probably deal with someone like Rob, but it's kind of like, I mean, on this particular case, Salivar. But it turns out that it was all a ruse because the whole point was like, hey, I actually need you to take out the enemy because now I can run things. The fact is, you thought I was really going to help you, you idiots, you kicked me out of my home, and now I'm going to get my revenge. It's like, oh, what I need is... Cisco to get there, which I figured as much later on. Obviously, at the end of the episode, we got the whole situation with um Gypsy helping him out because, like, you know, I was like, there had to be a reason why they brought Gypsy up at the beginning, like opening like that. I was like, maybe because obviously he doesn't just need like Cisco, as we've also known. Obviously, there are other people with similar powers, and in, in this particular case, we got introduced to one not too long ago. That. Same that person being Gypsy. What I am curious about though is why she helps him, and I can only chalk it up to he's blackmailing her because he knows. Because obviously he gets inside of people's minds and everything. Maybe he read Cisco's mind and knows about HR being alive, and it's like, oh, I will, I will reveal that basically you let HR live, and he's supposedly dead. So basically, if it comes turns out the fact is that she didn't do her job, that she's in danger. But it's like, what, how how would that even be a situation? I mean. He obviously reached out to HR because, I mean, like I said, this whole thing was a trap. So, obviously, if he's able to reach out to someone like HR to kind of tell him, like, oh, use some kind of equation and stuff, like some kind of um, scientific or mathematical problem, whatever, to kind of pique his interest and get him to come there, then maybe he can get in contact across worlds. I mean, it's like she's from Earth-19, so it's like, how does she – not unless there's more to this than that. I am very curious. Like, that, like I said, that's my only thoughts on, like, why she would work with him. But um, maybe it's connected to the world. Like maybe Grodd is promising her something like, oh, the fact is I can help make your world better. Or maybe it's just something to her personally of being like, oh, I can reward you for helping. Because it's like, why would she do that? Especially on an earth that she knows Cisco is, what she got has feelings for him. You know, it seems like, I mean, like her job is as a bounty hunter. So maybe it's just like, I don't really get paid. You know, it's kind of a job that she necessarily doesn't want. Or maybe it's like a situation where it's like, I don't want it for the rest of my life. I mean, like I said, we just really have to wait till the next episode to really find out like what that's all about. As we know, Salivar isn't dead because Barry didn't want to kill him. But the sad thing is, doing fighting Salivar and beating him actually had the opposite effect because it's like, because obviously he's like, yo, I showed him mercy, so we don't want a war, don't try and start a war with us. But all it did was make them fear him even more because they already don't like humans, but now it's like they see that their human is capable of beating like the strong, their strongest. So it kind of instills fear. It's like, no, we got to take them out before they come here. Obviously, one of them is able to come here and do that. What's to stop a whole army of them coming here to take uh, take our world from us? So, I did like the fact is that you know to deal with the whole situation, they faked Barry's death by having Caitlyn use her powers to kind of freeze him. I was like, hmm, why did you use Barry? And then uh, like a, qu a second later, I was like, right, because Barry's the only one that'll be able to recover from it. Like obviously, you need to slow his heart down, and his body, lower his body temperature enough to make it look like he's dead. The only person who'd be able to come back from faking it like that would be Barry because he'd be able to move his body rapidly enough to heat up his body to kind of come back from it. So, uh, I mean, but sadly, you know, with the whole gypsy situation, it does seem like this is setting in motion. It's showing like it, it seems like more and more like the more they try to think like, oh, we're going to change things the more things stay the same. Literally, the only thing they've actually changed was the whole like. Oh, Plunder being arrested by Wally, which I can only assume subsequently before that happens, what's going to happen is Plunder's going to get away and Barry's going to have to subsequently catch him again. And now it's like, because like I said, so far, the only thing they've changed is literally one thing. Nothing else has changed. They've been working to change other things, but it hasn't worked out like that. So, but this episode also, um, much like its uh, counterpart, Supergirl, um, which I, I kind of count, count, count all the shows as counterparts of one another, uh, since they're just kind of all set in the same DC universe to a certain degree, obviously, 
you know, Supergirl's on a different Earth, but you get the point of the universe that is the Arrowverse is kind of what it, you know, that's all kind of spanned off from. But nevertheless, um, this is a, kind of a romance episode two, focusing on two particular relationships. Obviously, we're building up more of the um, Julian and Caitlyn situation. You know, the whole reason for coming, obviously, mainly, like I brought up earlier, was mainly for Caitlyn's sake. And she's, like, warning him. is like, you need to stay away from me because the fact is that, you know, the whole Killer Frost thing. Which did not come up in the episode as much as I thought it would. Like, more in particular, the whole Caitlyn thing. It's like Grodd kind of ignored her a little bit. Because it's like... He blames... Like, she, he's mad that she used him. But it seemed like in this episode, like, he tried to ignore her completely. I'm guessing more so than anything because he didn't want to be swayed by her words. Um... Maybe that's why he spent so much time talking to them directly through other people. I mean, more so than anything, it's probably like, hey, this way I don't have to worry about going to you directly. I can, I'll come to you when I need to, but till then, I'll talk to you through someone else, whether it's Cisco or Wells. And speaking of Wells, I do appreciate the fact is that he um found out about his uh, counterpart. It's like, yeah, it must be thanks to you that we came, uh, got back, and it's like... Wait, what? You're not smart. Then why the hell is he here? It's like, well, in his own weird way, he's part of the team. He actually does help us out in his own weird way. But um, it's like basically what I was getting to at first with the Caitlyn situation. It's like, oh, be careful around me because the fact in the matter is, you know, I'm dangerous. Killer Frost could come back at any moment in time. I'm very interested to see, like, you know, with what next episode is kind of setting up because it's like, yo, we've got three speedsters, dude. And it's like, I'm super excited. We got... We got Barry, we got Wally, we got Jesse. But the whole thing is like, um, I'm also curious to see what happens if we have, if he fi- if Grodd finds out about Caitlyn being Killer Frost, he might be more willing to take her by his side because he'd be like, oh, I, you're evil, you're you're different like me. Now, like, obviously we had a little connection before, but now we have one even more so because you're different. You know, Grodd can't be accepted as just a regular gorilla because he's so much more. So... I don't know, that's just something I'm kind of interested to see if that would kind of pop up or not. But uh, the other relationship that was kind of popping up in this episode was Jesse and Wally. And at first, Jesse's kind of like, oh man, I don't like, you know, at first she's kind of pushing Wally away about the whole superhero situation. I'm like, part of me is like, okay, she kind of worried because she's like, oh, I was like, did she come across some other superhero on Earth too? Because currently the only other speedster on Earth too is her now that, you know, fake Jay Garrett has been dealt with. Which, and since I'm I'm speaking about that, I just thought about that, like kind of going back to the whole Caitlyn situation, I hope things with her and Julian work out, because it's going to suck if it doesn't, because it's like every season, let's it's like, let's find a new way to break Caitlyn's heart. It's like, for I mean, technically the whole, well, at first she thought Ronnie was dead, and he obviously came back and did, but then the whole situation happened at the end of, well, end of season one slash the beginning of season two, and then it's like, oh, well, opened up my heart again, and it's like, oh, Jay Garrett slash Hunter's Element, oh, my heart's broken again, so... Hopefully it doesn't happen with this whole situation with Julian, but I mean, who knows what they decide to do with Julian? Like, it could be like, oh, we make him into alchemy again, or maybe it'd be a situation where it's like, oh, you make him into alchemy, and you also make her into Killer Frost. I mean, like I said, I've thrown that out there as like her being the one to end up betraying Team Flash. I mean, literally, I mean, I've thrown it out there being Cisco. But I like obviously the first choice on my mind is. Caitlin, but I've kind of thrown it out there like, oh, I, this is how I feel like it could be Cisco, but maybe not. Now I'm thinking, like, because someone had thrown it out in the comments, basically, been like, oh, maybe it's Wally, maybe, you know, and now with Jesse in his life and everything, maybe that would be kind of an extra reason as to, because it's like, without going into details, without spoiling it, like, you know, maybe it has something to kind of do with what happens to Jesse in the comic books or something like that. I don't know. Maybe a similar circumstance happens here. Like even that's kind of a spoiler in itself. I kind of brought that up before. It's like I hope what happens to Jesse in the common books doesn't happen to her. Like I don't understand. I don't know the whole circumstances around her being a speedster in the common books. Um, I don't know if they'll necessarily do that. They easily could, especially because things between her and Wally are hitting off. But kind of getting back to the point I was making earlier. At first, I was like, oh, she's mad because he is a superhero now, and he's kind of getting so full of himself that being, you know, part of Wally's whole thing, because it's like, oh, he's saving the day and everything. He's getting so cocky. It's like, oh, man, I just came here to kick these people's butt. There's nothing else. But you see her sighing and everything and finding out he's a speedster. But the reason behind that is it's kind of a, you know, interesting reason is because she feels like Wally, you know, things between her and Wally were 
okay before they became speedsters, but then she became a speedster, and all he wanted to was become a speedster, and now that he has become one, she feels like basically he'll be fulfilled, that basically maybe in Wally's world and in his heart, there won't be any room for her, because I mean, basically this entire time, ever since subsequently becoming a speedster, they've lost contact, they haven't stayed, you know, even though they were supposed to kind of keep in contact and everything, which I guess... I can only assume the, because subsequently since she left, maybe Wally hasn't sent her any messages. I mean, maybe he has, but, you know, he's like, oh, things have been so busy. It's like, you know, becoming a speedster, training on their Barry, trying to save his sister and everything. So he hasn't really kept in contact with her. But like I say, it's it's understandable to feel that way because it's like, oh, the person you're in love with is like hasn't really kept in contact. So you're like, you're wondering if you're just going to be like, you know, you're afraid to kind of put yourself out there because it's like you don't know if that person will really – whether she, she won't know won't know 100% if she will come first or whether she'll come second to his powers which you know for Wally it's all about having you know it's like yeah I love my powers and everything and it's awesome and I love being a hero but it's like that won't change the fact is of how I feel about you but she's still a little scared because even Wally's asking like why don't you stay here which she's like I can't do that because there's no way my dad's going to agree which HR is like who cares what your dad has to say? Follow your heart because the last thing you want to do is have regrets. You know, you don't want to grow up and look back on life and realize, like, oh, you regret that you didn't make that decision. You know, in this particular case, staying here on Earth 1 and being with Wally, which makes it sound like HR knows more so than anyone, kind of a similar circumstance. Maybe it's a circumstance where him and his partner were in love with the same woman. His partner acted because he didn't act, because he was too scared to act, and maybe his partner hooked up with a woman he loved, and he was never able to say anything. Maybe that's one particular reason. I mean, because for him, this is all about starting over, you know. He's kind of a hopeless romantic in a sense. But what I really do appreciate is the fact is that when he was, like, helping her out, it's like, oh, you two, invite me to the wedding and everything, and he's seeing HR, I mean, the, um, Earth 2 Wells laying down it, um... It's like, yeah, because obviously he needs to rest and everything from everything that's happened. And he's looking, he's like, yeah, he's going to be pissed when he wakes up. And you see that smile on his face, like, uh, it makes you wonder, did he do that just to piss off um, Earth 2 Wells? Maybe just some need to be like, yeah, you know, he's like, yeah, your dad might be smart about the whole science thing. But when it comes to matter of the hearts, I'm kind of a, a genius, so... That was a good thing, kind of seeing them get together. But like I said, that also seems like that might be leading to something else, too. Like, I hope it doesn't go down that route, but it will. But for now, I won't really say anything because I don't want to jinx it, even though, like, you know, it's probably already written out that things are going to play out this certain way. So me saying it isn't like it's going to uh, bring it into reality. So a very good part one. I'm very interested to see what goes down in part two because it seems like a full on invasion, you know, and it's going to take all three of them working together to deal with this situation. It's like, dude, like I said, this is going to be the moment where we have all three, like at least three speedsters working together against them. Like obviously the, like the whole situation with Savitar, it was like Barry as well as Jay working separately from even Wally who had just kind of really gotten into his powers at that point. So this is going to be the first time we see all three of them kind of work together. And it's, I just already know it's going to be spectacular. Very looking forward to next week's episode. And now moving on to this week's episode of Legends of Tomorrow. A very good episode where we kind of have the team bouncing between the future and the past. When I saw the fact that it was 3000, because I kind of got glimpses, so I knew we were going to Camelot. But I was like, oh, we're going to the future? It's like, oh, is this going to be like a 3000 Camelot? Oh, no. It's just we're stopping into the future for a little while. Because they haven't gone into the future very much. Uh, which we brought up a very interesting thing where Nate's like, yeah, I don't like the future. It's because the future is unpredictable. It's like you don't know what's in store for you in the future because it's like un un all of its unknown territory. At least with the past, he's a, he's a historian. He's an architect. So he knows like, oh, yeah, this, this, this didn't happen. So it's easy to kind of work around certain things. It's kind of you know exactly where you're going into. But in the future, it's like you have no idea. Uh, we ended up finding out some lot of things. Uh, for instance, that basically Rip at some point worked, the Justice, worked with the uh, Justice Society of America. Apparently, there was a mission that one of their last missions was basically connected to the Spear of Destiny. That's how Rip got his hands on because he was working with them. And basically what happened is it got split up. One piece went to Stargirl. One went to Dr. Midnight. One went to Rip. And we didn't really get too much of a focus on it, but it seems like the other piece went to Commander Steel, uh, Nate's grandfather. So I can only assume that's going to be the next stop, you know, going forward. What exactly time period that would be, we won't know because everyone got sent to different time. Dr. Midnight got sent to the future. Stargirl got sent to uh, medieval times. Uh, she kind of, I, I like, it, it kind of goes hand in hand with Supergirl because obviously we got Mix and he had the power to bend reality. And it seems like Stargirl can kind of do the same thing too. I'm not that familiar with her. I've seen a, her 
to a certain extent here and there, but I've never really seen real. I don't even understand like the full, what she's fully capable of, but it seems like she can almost bend reality too. I'm assuming that must just be magic in general. I mean, because it seems like now that I'm sitting here thinking about it, it's like magic kind of bends reality, you know, in general. So I'm assuming that's just how magic always works in DC Universe. I don't know whether her powers count as magic. I assume they do. Maybe they don't. But, um, I mean, it would make sense because she is Merlin in Camelot, which is where they eventually had to go because Rip ended up killing Dr. Midnight and ended up stealing his piece of it because apparently it was inside of his body. I really appreciate the time zone kind of the same way that Ray does because Ray appreciates because he's always dreamed about Camelot and everything, which Nate, it's very like, oh man, I know history is like, oh, Camelot's not the thing that you think it is. It's like, you know, there's a difference between legend and history. You know, it's it's a very thin line and it, it seems in this particular case, but like I said, Stargirl kind of warped reality to fit more soul of kind of fit that mold a little bit better. But, um... Like, I'm alone the same lines as Ray because it's like, after Samurais and Ninjas, which we know that Nick has a huge thing for Ninjas, uh, after that comes Knights for me. So this is another favorite spot of mine. I was like, this is so cool. And the fact is that, you know, it's kind of in a similar circumstance of just like, hey, the fact is this is a time. I mean, it's kind of interesting when you actually think about it because this is kind of another time period that is a moment for um ray i mean granted you know the shogun episode which was like episode three uh dealing with the samurais and stuff was kind of nate's episode but it was also ray's episode as well so this is kind of another similar thing where it's like oh he kind of fits the mode and you know even becomes a knight and he's up there enjoying everything um then you had uh the whole sarah and uh guinevere situation which is like so obvious it's like Sarah just can't help herself. It's like there's a beautiful woman in front of her. It's just like she can't help herself, which no one can blame her. It's like, you know, I did like what Ray said to her. It's like, you know that, you know, most legends end with a kiss, which Gwyneth got that kiss. I was wondering how that was going to work out because it's like, well, she's married to Arthur and everything, which, I mean, apparently that hasn't stopped, you know, her in the past because there was the whole thing at the beginning. Like she was being burnt at the uh, stakes as a witch. Because she basically got... I don't know if that lady she was hooking up with was married or not. I get the feeling like she was, but I might be remembering that wrong. I mean, obviously, it's just at that point in time, you don't want to you know, be in that particular cir circumstance of being gay. But still, uh, it does make you wonder, like... I get the feeling like she was married or something, so that added more heaviness to it. But, like I said, it's at that time, too. So it's like, oh, the foul evilness of oh, woman shall not lay with one, blah, 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 whatever. But I really enjoy this episode on so many levels because, obviously, like I said, the whole Ray aspect of it. But I also love the fact is that Dark was here dressed as a knight too, and that stupid line of just being like, being like the king has left the building. And he's like, oh, you don't you don't understand that reference? Well, that's a pity. It's just like you're such a douchey bad guy, and I love it. It's just like it was such a thing in Arrow, and I appreciate the fact is that they've kept that. That that's such a central part of him. That he is such a douchey bad guy, and I like him for it just because he makes wisecracks like that. Just even I even like obviously there's a little dissension amongst the ranks because he doesn't look at you know obviously he's never really been big on playing with others. I mean, arguably it kind of makes sense because playing with others hasn't really worked out for him because it, you know he's dead in the present day and whatnot. But um. The fact is, Rip is like, oh, like the fact is, I thought you'd want me to kind of take charge of all these knights we have control of because the fact is that I've already collected two pieces of the Spear of Destiny. He's like, for one, don't talk to me like that. Show me some damn respect. I'm not one of these uh, drones that you control, obviously being the knights, King Arthur included. But it also had one of my favorite moments of just I oh, that's I've talked about it. That's one of my favorite things about this show is when everyone gets together on a battlefield. It was basically the controlled knights as well as Arthur versus Guinevere leading the knights, Ray being one of them. Even using he even like used his Adam suits gauntlets to kind of create a, a lightsaber. He got the guy a knight nearby was like, Oh my god, that's a saber of light. And Ray's like don't say lightsaber, because that's, you know, trademark. I was like, dude, that's so sick that you did that. And then he also had that sick moment in the fight where he jumped off that dude's back when leaping in the air and slashed that other knight off the horse. It's like, they didn't need to do that. Once again, like I brought up in the uh, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. episode, once again, I'm recording these out of order. Love me some slow-mo. And it was just like, that was such a sick moment. I love leaping in the air slow-mos. Those are so sick, dude. Now that I think about it, I don't, 
I mean, I, I kind of brought it up a little bit, but uh, Daisy did the exact same thing. It's so interesting that that happened. With, I don't know. Nevertheless, uh, the point is, it's just like this sick fight of just everyone fighting. And once again, it's like, it's swords. If you don't know anything about me, swords are like my favorite weapons. Obviously, I don't mess with swords because I don't trust myself because I'm clumsy and most likely to either hurt someone around me or end up hurting myself by like cutting my own hand or my finger off or something. So I don't trust myself. But, you know, weapons that I've always admired, ever since I was a little kid, I've always loved swords. There's been a whole, like, there was a video I made a long time ago talking about the fact that I would make swords out of coat, um, coat hangers and stuff like that. I mean, that's that's n nor here nor there. Uh, well, it kind of, I mean, it, it affects this because that's also why I like samurai so much is because they use swords, in particular katanas. I, I, I don't know which one I prefer more of, broadswords or katanas. I think I prefer katanas just because, like, it's such, you know, just the design of it. Like, I mean, it's designed to be, like, a good sword, so I don't know. But that's just why I like samurais and knights so much is because of that. And, you know, ninjas, too. Obviously, ninjas have other things in their arsenal, but they also use swords. I know I'm getting off the point here. Um... A big part in this episode, too, was also the whole situation of, like, getting a little too sentimental and that interfering with the mission. Because at first, you know, obviously Dr. Midnight is dead, which it hits Amaya hard because it's like, yo, you let Rip go. You know, Jack told me the fact is that he had a gun on Rip and you let him go, which Sarah's like, well, fact is we're not killers, which Martin quickly interjects. He's like, well, you know, with the exception of you and... Mick and he's like I'm just I'm just gonna you know shut my mouth but basically it's like that's not the way we do things you know not aside from the fact is that Rip is their ally they don't go out of their way to kill people it's like oh you didn't have to kill him at the very least apprehend him but you know for Sarah it's like no our people come first and she's kind of like that sen sentimentalism is what you know led to this situation happened to one of my friends and allies dying so it kind of got Sarah kind of questioning herself later on in the episode because she even tries barking orders to Mick. It's like, oh, we got to go back and get uh, Palmer. When she was like, what? don't order me around, Blondie. I thought it was about to turn into a nasty situation, but everyone was like, no, we can't do that. We're not leaving someone behind. We're not. We're, that's not our style because they always put the team first, which... You know, arguably, you can see fault in it, you know, because Amaya was always so focused on the mission, like, oh, I have to do this. You know, because it's like getting so caught up in like, oh, putting someone else's, you know, because it's like the Justice Society of America has their own way of doing it. But like I said, legends have their own way, too, because like I said, no, I brought it up countless times. No matter how dysfunctional they are, they are a family. So protecting and looking out for each other is their main job, obviously, aside from protecting time and everything and keeping it in order. So because even Amaya was kind of questioning, it's like, oh, Stargirl doesn't want us to help. It's kind of the same mentality, except Stargirl kind of shifted things a little bit because it turns out her main reason for staying here and wanting to be here is because she's in love with Arthur, which is like, yo, you should understand more than anyone, Amaya, because you followed your heart, so let me follow mine. I mean, that's the main reason why she's with the Legends in the first place is because she was seeking revenge, you know, it's kind of what... This is all about, and it's it's kind of interesting how she brought up the, like, you know, it's kind of almost hypocritical when you go, Amaya, you kind of went across this because of sentimental reasons. You're on this whole mission for sentimental reasons. And it does kind of beg up the question, does she plan on not bringing Rex back? Because it doesn't seem like that's her main focus anymore. But I guess it's a, coming across the Legion of Doom kind of reinvigorates that inside of her, if they can, like, but it also seems like there's things between her and Nate. Obviously, last episode, they make it seem like, okay, we don't need to kind of take this any further. But then having a conversation with um, Stargirl, realizing that, you know, you need to follow your heart, maybe that might make her think things differently. So it does beg the question, like, is there, I mean, there might not be any way of bringing Rex back, even if they stop Eobard, I mean, not unless they make it so that they completely erase him from the timeline, which is like, I don't know if they'd actually do that because it's like, I mean, there's still so much they could do with a reverse flash. So I'm sure they're not trying to get rid of him. I mean, obviously the point is to stop him, but I get the feeling maybe at the end of this, this might be his end. Like this is, I mean, you would think out of any place he would meet his end, it'd have to be the flash. But like I said, maybe, maybe there's a particular reason why they put Legends of Tomorrow here on Tuesdays rather than keeping it on Thursdays. I mean, besides just the Riverdale situation, it's like, they could have put that on, I don't know, it just, it seems, I'm very curious to see why they did that, and then maybe that will kind of play into it, like, there are certain things that's going to code down in the Flash that's going to be affected on Legends, or maybe there's stuff they need to get out first with Legends that will be affecting Arrow, or, you know, vice versa, you know, that type of thing, so. So, like I brought up before, it does seem like there probably will continue to be something going on between Amaya and Nate, or at the very least, they're setting that up. Um, at the very least, um, 
we do know that Stargirl's safe because obviously they have that piece of the spear. So, I mean, obviously they have the head of it too. I kind of wish it had stayed on Excalibur, but sadly that was not the case. It wasn't meant to be. I did like the fact is that uh, when she pulled it out, like she tapped into all those different powers and then even like you had Sarah being like, okay, I'll admit it. that was, that was pretty awesome. But also another thing in this episode was kind of those mind control devices. You had that moment where like basically Stein has stole it from the future. And then you had Mick being the one to figure out. He's like, I can smell something. There's always, you know, a thief, you know, kind of has a certain smell about him. It's like, oh, you stole something. He's like, you stole off a dead guy too. He's like, I'm so, I'm so proud of you, professor. There might be hope for you yet. But it turns out that will be the case later on. They didn't need it because Rip's got control of everyone with this particular device. And at first, you know, Martin kind of wants to use it on, you know, use himself as an example of like trying to use brain, trying to control people, which Jax is like, he's like, because Stein's like, oh, we have to use someone with a very immense brain power and everything. He's like, you don't mean, he's like, okay, if you're going to ask me to do it, fine, I'll do it, you know. But it turns out the person they need, in fact, is Mick because it's not driven by brain power, it's more intensity. And out of anyone on the crew, there's no one more intense than Mick. So basically, it's him that's needed. And it's like, okay, so when the time comes, we're going to need you to take over this uh, dark evil army. And he's like, oh, the destiny I've been meant for. And just, you know, you have time to be like, God, I, we all are scared of that day. But luckily, it was Mick who did kind of pull things out in the end, uh, getting everyone, all the knights back under control, kind of getting them free of that brainwashing which you know he will not be letting he definitely won't let stein live it down of being like oh the fact is it was my brain that saved the day not yours my brain's better than yours uh so um kind of going back really quickly i brought it up the whole amaya situation like uh star girl kind of told her like hey like the way you're acting the way you are around them that obviously she found a new home with the legend so Will it be a permanent thing? Like, I'm very curious to see, like, when it's all said and done, will it be a permanent thing? Will she permanently stay with the Legends or what? Because it really all depends on whether this whole situation with Eobar is dealt with. Well, not just Eobar, but the Legion of Doom. I wonder why they sent only... Well, they didn't really just only send Dark. They also sent Rip, too. Which, at the end of the episode, he kind of got captured. Because Sarah, you know, he's like, oh, so you're going to land the final blow? It's like, she'd be justified in doing it since you, like, not only shot her, but broke her neck. Uh, but, you know, she's not that person anymore, she's not, you know, I mean, truth be told is, her training's there, but it's like, she's not a killer anymore, and truth be told is, the League of Assassins isn't a thing anymore, I mean, technically it's not, present day it's not, I mean, who knows what it's like in the future, I do hope they go to the future more, like, obviously this season's all been about, about going to the past, I'd like to see some more time traveling to the future, we've only seen bits here and there, so... I mean, like I said, we don't know exactly where Commander Steel is. I mean, for all we know, he might be located in the present day or something like that. Because Rip sent them all to different points in time. It does make me wonder, when did Rip do all this? Was it in between season? Like, you know, because there was that bit at the end before he came back to get the rest of the team. Maybe it's around that time he did this. Um, maybe it was sometime before. Because... It might have. It was either kind of like before he picked everyone up again at the end of season one, or at some point during that six month period between season one and season two. But it seemed like everyone was together, so I wouldn't know at what point he would have done it. But then again, it's like it's time travel, so it could have been ripped from any point in time to kind of, like, you know, it's it's confusing. But he's back on the ship, and you had that moment where Jax was like, yeah, the fact is, I spared you before for because Sarah asked me to. And he's like, but if you hurt anyone, this you're not captain anymore. This is my, you know, uh, this isn't your ship anymore. And it's like, you hurt anyone, I will end you. And so, oh, you're glad to get that off your chest. And he walks away, and then you hear Rip talk to Gideon, which I guess no one really thought about the fact is, I guess, I guess you could look at it as a situation where it's like, well... You would think they would have been able to modify that, but then at the same time, I guess they would have never thought to because it's like, well, Gideon obviously wouldn't work on Rip, work Rip, but Rip, you know, even though he still is brains a little confuddled right now, he still probably would know how to bypass Gideon. But it doesn't even seem like he had to. Gideon just automatically responds to him. But like I said, it seems like something you would think to kind of deal with, but you know, at the same time, it's like at, in the circumstances, I guess you really wouldn't think about that. 
But it's definitely going to be an interesting episode next time with him on board the ship. All like, you know, one of the pieces of it up there as well, you know, what it means for him and what it means for the crew with him kind of free to do whatever he wants, especially because he knows the ship so well. It's probably going to be, I mean, this situation will be very different from the last time he was on the ship because it's like, there's no like stopping everyone, not unless he has access to some of the equipment. I mean, he did, like I said, he does know it's a ship and the ship's online and he is talking. To, I mean, the only reason why Gideon was not an issue last time or, or that was even a possibility was because Gideon was also affected by the EMP. So well, basically the equivalent of an EMP. I know Dark ended up bringing it up in the episode. He ended up leaving uh, Rip behind because he's like, oh, I'm not the type to kind of help an ally. But it's like helping him would end up helping you because he's the only one that really knows where the rest of the Spear of Destiny is. So why would you leave him behind? That kind of puts you at a disadvantage. But I guess that could be uh, Rip kind of makes his way back to them anyway. I'm sure the whole plan was to kind of basically eventually kind of undo his brainwashing, much like they did with Mick. But... Like I said, we won't really know what goes down until the next episode, which will not be, there won't be an episode next week, but there will be the one after that, which will be March 7th. So just keep that in mind. Very interested to see uh, where we go from here. Like more in particular, what time period as well as what direction the story goes. So, And now moving on to this week's episode of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. This was such a good episode. Basically, it's one of those episodes that kind of like fits along the lines of that spy episode, like where just there's so many twists and turns in it. And like it to me, it, it's very reminiscent of the episode back in basically episode in season three where it's a similar situation where it's like, oh, you don't know who has been whammied by Hive. And it's a very similar circumstance because it just got me with every little twist. Because at first, it's like, oh, we got to replace those two. I'm like, what? It's like, no, because I, so, I was like, why are they saying replace the two? It's like, shouldn't it be like replace one of them? Because it's like, obviously Fitz is one of them because I brought that up last episode. I was like, well, then maybe really it isn't Fitz. I was like, huh? Or maybe it's like, maybe it's a situation where they don't realize that Fitz is one, but he knows because, you know, you know, maybe Radcliffe or Ida, Ada had it programmed so they wouldn't know that there's another one there to kind of keep them in the dark. But it turned, the twist comes and it gets revealed. It's like, oh, the reason why it said both of them, because we're talking about Simmons and Daisy, because Daisy didn't get replaced. Dude, I was like, that's so good. I did not. Oh, that was such a good twist, dude. Especially because it came down to it. And I was like, the mo I was like, okay, wait. Obviously, it's Fitz. You know, when it, when him and Simmons walk into that room, it's like, oh, an LND had been found. I was like, wait. It's like, I, it's hard to tell because it's like, you know, especially because Fitz was doing a good job. I was like, oh, my God, you've been replaced. And he's like, oh, you, you're the one pointing the gun at me. It's like, and then he cut his wrist. I was like, oh, dude, what were they being messed with? And it's like, it's like, no, he just played it up real good. I was like, dude, that is so dis like deliciously evil and I loved it. It was such a it, like, I gotta give props to the actor who plays uh, Fitz for doing that. That was so good, dude. I was like, dude, I was halfway blind. I was like, oh man, oh man, he really cut himself. He's bleeding bad. It's like, nope, that was just kind of the top layer of blood kind of coming through and making it seem like it was worse than it was. It's like, dude, they... That was so good, especially because like, I really was so sure that Daisy was replaced because they went to the point of being like, oh, there's four that have been replaced. But obviously, that's the point to kind of deceive even Simmons. But I brought it up last episode. And, like, I knew it had to be Fitz. I was like, oh, obviously, we're focused on those four. But I was like, I know it has to be Fitz. He has to be replaced, too, because he was off on his own. The only person that wasn't by themselves during that whole circumstance was Simmons. So I know it couldn't have been her. But I, even I had started having doubts during the episodes. But I was like, I should have stayed fast, steadfast, uh, steadfast with my beliefs. I guess, like, when it comes down to it, I guess there's, like, two reasons why they didn't replace uh, Daisy. For one, I guess it wouldn't be easy to overpower her. And two, I guess at the same time, it was also because, I think, it's because she's an inhuman and the whole point. I mean, it seems, obviously, that they were going to replace Daisy eventually, but I guess at the time, they didn't really have an opportunity to after she immediately kind of made quick work of Anton, so... Maybe Ida, Ada never had a chance to get to her. So, but I thought, you know, because the fact of the matter is, it's hard to really replace an inhuman because they can use their powers, and even an LMD can't fake using an inhuman's powers. Which we kind of go back to it. Like in this episode, because at first, like, there's a lot of things. One I brought up last episode, I wasn't sure. I was like, oh, do they know they're LMDs or not? It's like, no, they were programmed to know that they're LMDs, which even Radcliffe's like, you shouldn't have done that because that means 
a lot of people could die because like what made May's situation work is because she didn't know so I didn't have to worry it was a best way to keep her cover but also you know make it so that she wouldn't you know act on her directives and end up killing people unnecessarily obviously the LMDs are like oh we don't want to kill anyone but it's like obviously we have no choice especially when Fitz got brutally murdered by Simmons and the fact is it's up there trying to saying all these things like the fact is that oh Fitz wants to marry you and everything it's like oh she's like you've never said that before it's like yeah because he's always thought it but he's just never said anything about and even when she's stabbing it repeatedly she's like Simmons don't it's Jim it's me and it's just like dude I mean what even got to that sad point it was like dude it was heartbreaking like the fact is you have Simmons being like get away from me Daisy I don't know it's like you don't know you're an LMD until you're dead and it's like dude I, you've ne I've never seen Simmons like so shaken like that dude and it's so sad uh, but luckily like they had each other that was just so good and just, oh, talk, like, I got to talk about the action in the episode, too. Daisy going up against Mace. That was just a full-on brawl and battle. Plus, she doesn't have her gauntlet. So, so at first, she's obviously trying to reduce how much of her power she's using. So she's going at him hand-to-hand -hand combat, kicking ass, dude. Especially that moment she was, like, on her back. And then she kind of flipped up and, like, flipped up, hit him, but also kind of landed on her feet. It's like, dude, that was sick. Fighting him like crazy at the same time. Also using her powers, kind of boosting herself up and just punching him. And then there was that sick moment. She's got a bullet in her shoulder and a bullet in her leg from uh, the fake Coulson and Matt. And then she kind of does that moment, like movement between her hands, kind of summoning up her power. And then she fires it, and like literally the power is so much that it starts ripping like LMD Macabar. Like, and he did it in slow motion. I was like, that's so sick, dude. You, I, dude. I can't help it. That was probably like the highest moment of the episode. For obviously the twist and turns, but action wise, that was like the coolest moment. I was like, that is so sick. Oh, dude. I, I brought it up before. I love me some slow motion, but just the fact that she was able to do that, break them apart. Like, that's like, dude. At the same time, it worried me because the entire time I was like, oh, don't use your powers too much, Daisy. You're going to mess up your arms. But it seems like obviously she limited it to not use it too much. But oh, that was so good. And there was also those other LMD um, daisies, I guess, to me, I think, because the whole point was to try and gather up all the Inhumans, so they kind of share, I guess Radcliffe kind of implanted the theory to basically, like, kill and replace all the Inhumans, essentially, mainly because they're kind of working with the Russians, and I'm sure Radcliffe, or rather, Ada kind of programmed them all to kind of, like, oh, wipe out Inhumans, like, the first one they were going after was Yo-Yo. So, I'm guessing the point was to have all those multiple daisies go out and meet all those different um, Inhumans all at once. And then when she gets near them, their guards are lowered and then the LMD daisies could end up killing all of them all at once, kind of. Like a simultaneous like assassination type of thing. That's what it seems like to me. Um, they never really went into too much detail, but I can only assume that's the reason why. Because like, why would you need that many when you only need one LMD to replace daisy? So I figured that was kind of the plan. Maybe they went over it and I just didn't catch that. So. But obviously they had the bad guy plan of being like, oh yeah, Simmons and Daisy, they're LMD. So I want you to go out there, like, the, you know, telling everyone in S.H.I.E.L.D. It's like, yo, go out there and shoot to Maine. Like, you know, basically kill them. It's the only way we can get to our people, essentially. It's just like, oh. Because another conversation piece that came up, obviously, is about the LMDs. Because what I like about the LMDs is the fact is that they're kind of extensions of people. It's like, we have all their memories and they're all their thoughts. I mean, not just their thoughts, but how they feel and everything. And he's talking to... LMD May, who didn't know he was an LMD, but now it's like, she started talking, and it's like, oh, what happened to Coulson? Like, what, what did Radcliffe do? And so it seems like there's a, like, basically, this whole framework situation is supposed to be like a utopia type of situation. Like, oh, we're building this perfect world where you basically don't have to suffer through hate, that basically everyone is able to kind of live in a world without their regret. Like, in Coulson's case, his biggest regret apparently was joining S.H.I.E.L.D. because so much bad stuff has happened, lost so many people because he joined S.H.I.E.L.D. and became, you know, so kind of, like, reversed that. And it's kind of like, it's a sense of, like, we don't want to hurt people, but we want everyone to be a part of the framework because it's like it's the best way as a way for, forward for everyone. Because I get like legitimate, it seems like the best plan is to basically incorporate everyone into the framework so that basically everyone in the world could probably be. It seems like that is the ultimate goal of making just everyone else an LMD. Uh, but. You know, it was just it was just kind of an interesting thing because it's like even though they're not these real people in these particular cases, these real people, they're still acting upon these memories to a certain degree. Obviously, because they know that they're LMDs, they follow their directive. They're not kind of weighed down by the pretenses of emotions or having hearts, essentially, you know. 
kind of like the LMD made, like she, like because she didn't know who she was at first, it made her a little too human, which kind of cost them in the end of the, near the end of the episode. Because LMD May was like there, she's at like oh she's blocking May, I mean um Simmons and Daisy, but she doesn't. She lets them go because it's like to her it's like. She realizes, like, yeah, I'm not a real May. I realize that now. But she's like, the fact of the matter is the way I feel is real. That's me. And she's like, I would go through. She was like, I, my main thing, obviously, was to get the dark hole. That was Radcliffe's part. But my reason wanting to protect Coulson is because of me. It's because she wasn't bogged down by the thought, knowing what she was, that she legitimately thought she was human to the extent that, like, she actually kind of had a heart of her own. Like, she was like, no. I actually care for Coulson. That's why she didn't fall for this. It's like, oh, we're the same. We're, you know, LMDs. It's like, because it's a sense. It's like, oh, don't worry that we're together in the framework, you know, Coulson and, you know, me and you. Because like I said, they kind of talk as if they are those people when they're actually not. But it's such an interesting thing. But like for her, she kind of grew a heart. It's like the only person I care about is Coulson because Coulson is like all those things. It's like, oh, you think all like basically like all these things like jealousy anger regret like they're a bad thing and she like i those are things that you know that make colson who he is and that's the person she loves so she ended up blowing herself i mean i don't know necessarily if it blew up a lot of the base but i mean it seems like it might have but um i wonder did that take care of uh fits because he did get repaired as well as did it take care of all those other daisies because those might still be a problem um next episode uh which I'm going to kind of get to in a second, but like obviously at the end of the episode, we have them kind of going diving into the Matrix type of situation where we had them uh, basically implanting themselves inside of the framework, replacing their framework counterparts. That's how they're going to track down the team and everything. Um, kind of before I go that route, I'm going to circle back around and bring up the whole Radcliffe situation, which I knew it was only a matter of time before. I, Ida like kind of took control of the situation and it seems she she has killed Radcliffe she slit his wrist and put him in the machine because basically he, him being the way he is created a paradox obviously she's supposed to take care of Radcliffe make sure that he's okay but also protect the framework but at the same time human emotions can are very unpredictable and the fact is you know obviously this whole framework is built around people helping them deal with the regrets and everything and she looked at and Radcliffe is like what if one day you decide that you regret you know, building the framework because the fact is all these people die and everything, you know, the outside body dies, but he's like, no, it doesn't matter. The outside bodies can die because their mind is still alive, which cleared up the paradox for because it's like, okay, so I don't have to worry about it. The best way I can do it is by killing your real body and having your mind in the framework. That way I don't have to worry about you ever, you know, having regrets. And now this way you won't have to be in a, You won't ever have to be in a situation where you even think about uh, destroying the framework because you no longer can. Which something else kind of got brought up in this episode is the fact is because she restarted the framework because basically she had to introduce everyone else's reality of the framework into the large because it's not like there's multiple multiple frameworks within, you know, like like she basically had to restructure the already existing framework. It's already like a large world. It's not like, oh, here's Fitz's world in the framework and then here's Colson's world. It's like all the world and basically she has to configure it in a way of integrating everyone's lives so basically she had to restart it where well, she was like oh there's a danger to doing that because like I, my mind could get lost in there not being able to distinguish reality from the framework so I feel like they made a point to point that out so I'm thinking that's definitely going to come up later on but um, it's kind of a um, race against time because we had the whole like if Simmons and Daisy don't get to the team in time like not only will the team's bodies die but now this also means that their bodies could die as well so oh it's just such a good episode and what this means going forward like multiple things you know it's like oh get up your boyfriend you know get your boyfriend out and Daisy was like oh Lincoln and she's about to walk towards the bed I'm like the fact that they ain't showing his face because I also know I also know that the actor who plays Lincoln is on blind spots so I was like oh so you know I was, I was thinking oh maybe they found time to and then I was like wait a minute it's not gonna be Lincoln is it and then the picture so I'm like it's Ward that's so good just because like in her own way like that was kind of the first person she really fell in love with. And I guess I guess you could arguably say, like, Ward is her biggest regret. Even It's kind of sad, but he's even an even bigger regret than Lincoln. Like, Lincoln, she regrets, but it's like, Ward is, like, probably the first, you know, because he was her mentor. He trained her. She fell for him, even with everything that happened, you know. That was probably, that's what, because his circumstance hurt her the most because, you know, she trusted him so heavily. And then it's like, you know... 
I'm sure it probably also was influenced by the fact is that when she was on the hives control, obviously he was in Ward's body, so I'm sure that kind of made some influence to that as well. Uh, she's definitely going to have a rude awakening, uh, awakening next episode when she realizes it's not Lincoln, that it's Ward. And like, I'm curious to see what she does about that. Also, we ended up seeing that Gemma is dead in this world. Now, I can own, I'm can. i interpreting that. I didn't look at the previews. I caught glimpses of it, but I don't know if they covered it in the previews. But to me, I can only assume that obviously we see Fitz taking some lady's hand. I think that's Ida. Ada. I think she killed Simmons in this world. I was like, you know, I was like, did Radcliffe do that? It's like, no, because this was all built by Ada. But it's like, I was like, could Radcliffe have done that because he felt like, you know, Fitz would be better off without Simmons, but it's like, no, because Ida has a thing for um, Fitz, because it's like, and it's in, in a different, she's infatuated with him in a different sense than Radcliffe. Radcliffe was a creator and everything, but I don't think she felt that way about, I think she definitely felt that way about Fitz, because Fitz was so, because of his brain, because he's also the one that kind of helped fit, put the final touches to her, like she's spending her time with him like, in those beginning days, like we kind of got associated with her at the beginning of the season. I'm thinking maybe that time spent together is what shaped her mind. So I'm thinking it's Ida who's the one that's in there with him, like some form of her to replace Simmons, and she killed Simmons because it's like, oh, she's, she's his past, and I can be his future like on some level i think i don't want to be with fitz because she admires him because he's the one that he's the brilliant mind that helped finish her or something like that and simmons would just be in the way i'm very curious to see how that plays out with the fact is that she is dead in the framework and what that means for her trying to replace herself like yeah she going obviously i'm probably not all zombie light but still and I'm also curious what it means about May's situation. Because we see May, she's in front of a Hydra building. So it's like, oh, wait, what happened there? I mean, it could, I mean, I'm curious about it. Could this be kind of their version of kind of incorporating that comic book storyline? Obviously, there's that big storyline, was that last year, that kind of got everyone in a huff, like everyone in a tizzy, that basically you had, um, Captain America being like, oh, hell, Hydra. So maybe they're kind of incorporating that to show to a certain degree. Like, obviously, they can't necessarily... I mean, it also makes you wonder, will they ever plan on doing that with the Marvel movies or something like that? That'd be kind of interesting. But uh, nevertheless, maybe they're kind of incorporating that story a little bit. It's like, maybe maybe a similar circumstance to Ward happens that basically after everything happened for May, after she got that good life, that basically things didn't work out, so now she worked. I mean, because the fact is, Coulson doesn't work for S.H.I.E.L.D. in this world either, so maybe it's a situation where it's like something else happened. Because the fact is, everyone's world changed, because obviously Coulson was there with her in S.H.I.E.L.D., because that, that's her perfect world. But it's like, what is, how does that... I guess now, but her entire world kind of got ship, shaped, because everyone else's reality had to be brought into it. So it kind of changed the circumstances around. It's uh, like my basic understanding of it. So it's like, I'm very interested to find out what that's all about. Like, what in her life went different to make her actually work for Hydra now? You know, maybe, like I said, maybe after what happened, maybe things didn't work out, you know, maybe in this reality, her and Coulson never got together. But no, definitely didn't get together because her and Coulson never met because they never worked in S.H.I.E.L.D. together. So, I don't know. It's, I'm not going to kind of go too far in it. Just overall, just a fantastic episode. Sadly, we will have to wait, 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 wait until April to see the next episode. So, dude, it's getting... I like that, though. It seems like they're changing things up, a little bit of the format, a little bit, because obviously we see the new logo. It's like a green Hydra uh, sign, so it's like, because the next episode is going to deal with diving into, I don't know, obviously it probably won't be a full season, the rest of the season type of thing. If it was, that'd be kind of cool, because like I said, usually the seasons are kind of split up into two. Obviously, the first half dealt with Ghost Rider, second half deals with the LMDs, but it's like, what if they split that even further? Just with the whole context of this episode, I was like, yeah, we're going to take a quite a long break, aren't we? And it's just like, it turns out to be the case. Also, some other things I want to talk about, like quickly add in. I, I'm sitting here thinking about, I was like, what could change in Max's life? And I can only assume with Max's life, you know, the fact is, him, maybe him and his wife stay together and he had, his child didn't die because that was kind of probably one of his biggest regrets. That's a, a storyline that was brought up and it seems obviously it's brought up to a kind of fit. Because obviously it's going to come down to it. It's like, the fact is, they're like Daisy as well as Simmons are going to have to try and figure out what they're going to do in this reality, trying to convince everyone to leave this these quote unquote perfect lives behind because it's like, oh, these are your lives. These are the lives you probably always wanted because, you know, now you no longer have any regrets. You just kind of live the perfect life. Um, 
Fitz, maybe this in this world, in this reality, he has a better relationship with his dad or something like that, because that's maybe that's something he's always regretted too. So, so uh, like I said, very good episode. I, I hate that I have to wait, but I'm super excited to see where like this next story takes us. Just everything going down the way it is. But really, that's all I want to talk about in this episode. Till the next time we meet, be happy, be safe, live life to the fullest, and enjoy it. Good day and goodbye.